So this subject uh, came up because of some discussions that have arisen among some of the members of City Club. And just a, a quick overview, and, and some of you may have some, you know, uh, academic knowledge on the subject. Some may have a more uh, internal experience of it. But the whole concept of the of the tree of good and evil, I'm going to uh, <coughs> sort of give you my own overview, and then you can all add yours. That went. That the first, it starts out with the creation story of Adam and Eve, and they were created in the image and likeness of the Ruach Elohim, the creative powers of the life breath. That was, you know, when you when it's translated in the King James Version, it's G-O-D. But if you look at the Hebrew, there are all these different aspects of deity that are referred to, but they all get the same treatment, G-O-D. And but the but the subtlety of the language tells us a, a very unique aspect about this particular expression of deity. And so we're told in the creation story of Adam and Eve, it says, And the Elohim said, Let us make man in our image and likeness. So in the image and likeness of themselves, they made man male and female. So the word man is sort of an umbrella, and it, from the Sanskrit, uh, it means manas, to think. It's the thinking principle. And ruach, the ruach Elohim, are also this creative thinking principle. And so we're made in the image and likeness in the sense that we're creative thinking principles. And male and female are under that same umbrella. So they, they talk about that. But there was, uh, as they're living in the, in the Garden of Eden, um, there are two types of creatures that live in the Garden of Eden. Uh, at least uh, there's, there's deity and the subsets of deity, such as the angelic kingdom. And then there are the unconscious creatures, subconscious. So Adam and Eve hadn't really entered into this concept of consciousness yet. And so the, the thing that would allow them to do it, it was a setup that they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, they become aware of one of the hermetic principles, which is the principle of polarity. The thing that swings to the right and the thing that swings to the left. And so, in a sense, it was kind of set up. And in the Gnostic Gospels, there's the story of the serpent who can't communicate to the man and the serpent who was the wisest of creatures. Okay? isn't able to penetrate into the man, so he speaks to the woman. And so the serpent is, is, an em, is emblematic of Sophia, or the wisdom aspect, and communicates to the woman and, and encourages her to eat from the tree, so she becomes awake to the world around her. And then Adam gets uh, coaxed into biting into the apple, and they both all of a sudden have this awareness of the law of polarity. That's good, that's bad, this is hot, that's cold, this is soft, this is smooth. This is pro-life. This is this is you know right to life, um, or uh, pro-choice, you know. And and that that condition has precipitated throughout the entire evolutionary process of humanity. But what? And they were expelled from the garden because they were no longer subconscious creatures. But they have not yet arisen to the state of divinity, at least in in a conscious union with the divine. And so they have this come down, if you will, to uh, this sphere and slog it out, trying to understand this law of polarity between two things. And you can ask a variety of people about a subject or a piece of politics or a condition or a theory and ask them if it's good or evil and you'll get different opinions because there is no such thing as... Um, 100% this or 100% that. We And I'm saying that with a little bit of a caveat that we might make arguments for certain things. But primarily, as a rule of thumb, uh, and especially if we take the Buddhist point of view, there are things that are more correct and less correct until one attains to what is called right view. And right view is the view that one has when they have fused themselves with this indwelling presence which is of a divine nature. And when that one perceives that, then they have balanced the pairs of opposites. So I bring this subject up for discussion, not for me to flap my gums for 45 minutes, but to, to begin to consider how is it that you perceive the nature of things and what category do you put them in? And when you stand next to someone else who is as honest perhaps and as vehement about their opinion and it differs than yours, where's the place of reconciliation? And how is it that we deal with those kinds of um, 
polarized expressions. All you have to do is look at Congress, okay? Or any one of our um, hot button issues that are really used to polarize the electorate and, and our nation and the world even. So I kind of give you a quick little overview of that and I'm willing to throw this around the table for anyone or anyone to kind of give their understanding about this concept of, of what we call good and evil. So there being no questions then. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, so yeah. I think it's fair to say in lower forms of life, whatever that means, maybe dogs or deer or amoebas, there's no evil. Right. They're not capable of it. So at some point this emerges, this concept, and you're saying that it comes with this polarity. And there, this time around five or 6,000 years ago, which I think is what we're talking about when we go to the earliest biblical tradition, is that, is that correct? Well, that's, that's the date probably. it's given. It's probably much earlier than that, but um, it doesn't matter. There's a period in time in the larger spectrum of, of timing that you've looked at is pretty insignificant. But I'm very fascinated with this period about 5,000 years ago where there is, there is a theory that at this time there was a consciousness structure that mm -hmm. emerged. Or you could even say an ego structure, a certain type of being, a certain type of person that, that had this immense power and this ability for good and, and evil. Uh -huh. But th this, it all seems to kind of line up that this, this time that the, the Bible, this, the story of Eden, and yeah. is really referring to this same event, which is the birth of civilization yeah. the, and the birth of our current consciousness regime that we're still in the throes of. There are other sacred that. texts that, that take that same idea, but they push the dates back pretty far. Um, it, but I, once again, whether it's six, there may have been a major event 6,000 years ago, and I think that's the of moment of what you're expressing. And but the consciousness aspect pro was no doubt emerging yeah. prior to that, and it had gradual, its yeah, it was a gradual unfolding. <clears throat> so perhaps that is a as a good you know, uh, what do you call it, a touchstone. Um, but if you read the Theosophical literature, they they push it back you know another maybe twice as many years, um, and I, somehow per perhaps it's not as relevant uh, as it is that something significant occurred six thousand years ago, that is a, that is a moment that we should pay attention to. So there is this concept then of good and evil that may have become more pronounced at that time. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm... Okay. And that's our current predicament today. I mean, that's, that we're still in this same period of time. We may think of that as ancient, the ancient world or something, right. Sumeria. But no, that, that's the modern world. And I think that's the, the theory is that's the transition that we're in the midst of now is to get past this into some new way of reconciling these polarities and I think that's we're all searching for that. Is everyone familiar with Roger's book by the way? He wrote a great book on on this long journey of <laughs> of creation and you are here now. It's just well, it ends at this point. It ends at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so the book it's it's, it's the it's background really a, amazing you know, like tome of, of research and saying you are here we are so now what what's next so i just thought i'd put that out there if you are interested in what roger's talking about he has uh, done a great deal of research on that subject jerry were you going to say something well what's going through my mind was um is, is it a learned is it a learned thing uh i mean are we born with good and evil or is it something that we learn over time yeah well i, I think that's a great question and uh, for myself, anyway, that I think that the enculturation process that we go through is overwhelming in many ways. That um, if you are, uh, anybody see with number 44, the movie by Jackie Robinson? Um, there's this one scene where he's out in the field and the father's throwing these, um, you know, racial epithets out. And the little kid's sitting there because he's, you know, not, and all of a sudden the kid starts mirroring his father, you know, shouting racial epithets. Right? So... Uh, there, the, the enculturation process is, is a huge hurdle uh, for us in every area. Um, and, and even when we think about Buddhism, for example, and the monks who live in the Himalayas and have you know, dedicated their lives to study, then all of a sudden they come to the United States and they're faced with merchandise. <coughs> There's a thing about choice, not a lot of choice when you're you know, up at um, 12,000 feet in a secluded monastery about Gucci loafers and Ray-Ban sunglasses. Um, but when they come to New York City or Boulder, Colorado, all of a sudden there there's this whole new world that opens up. But they're they're so enculturated within that pocket of study 
Uh, and then all of a sudden there's this other thing that kind of like throws a little interference into their general way of perceiving things. So, the, but I just in my own process, I don't know, one of the, my, my parents, my mother and her family in particular, well, you know how it is, son, we live, hope, and die in despair. And I said, well, wait a minute, I don't believe that. <laughs> I mean, that was what I was, yeah, I mean, that's what they used to tell me. I don't feel like I'm in despair. <laughs> And, and I, so I had to break out of that thing. But that's just one little snippet. And we all have those things. If we're very fortunate to have, you know, open-minded parents who are not trying to <clears throat> squash you, then, you know, you have a little bit of a head start. But meanwhile, you're like a, a somebody in the Amazon jungle with a machete trying to get out of the web, you know. But that's, that's a huge problem. So I've been studying recently um, a lot about fear as you know, a motivator, a driver, and kind of in in complement to what you're asking, you know, there's a lot of argument about, you know, we we learn fear, right? We're not born with fear. We don't come in with fear, but fear is very influenced by the experiences that we have. And so how much of what we define as good and evil is actually really defined by what we fear or our experience of fear. Yeah. That's a great point. Right. Um, was somebody else going to say something? I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Well, I was just going to add, actually, um, that there's a psychological model that says every person is inherently good, good-natured. So I, you know, I like to believe that, and I do believe that, but. <clears throat> Breaking it down to what you said as far as the fear, that's like that grand illusion that's so very real and um, it, within us, it's so, it runs so deep that we cover it up with all these other ways of judgment, <clears throat> judging, so. Yeah, and, but I, I would like to get back to, to your point because um, we are afraid of the unknown generally speaking, or, or we're told that certain things that are unknown, we, we ought to be afraid of them, and if you're not, why not? <laughs> so, you know, if, you know, you have to have a job and make this amount of money or you're going to die, or there's all these things that, were, that are thrown at us, all you got to do is watch the news and see the fear perpetuated. Um, and, and, that, and that sways votes, it sways consciousnesses. And, and so that's a huge, a huge piece um, that... The, the unknown and or those things that we're told are evil and that will kill you or hurt you or cause you to get sucked into a black hole with Satan or whatever, um, those are things that, that motivate and move us, or many of us anyway. And those, that's a huge problem. So this, it's not, you're kind of like at this tabula rasa when you come into life, the blank slate, and then somebody starts painting the pictures on it and you get in for the age of zero to the age of reason, which is seven, you're a sponge. And... Um, Bruce Lipton talks about that in 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 in, uh, in great de detail in his uh, the wisdom of the cells and how they actually absorb information and so on. So that's a huge a huge consideration. David, across cultures, I, I'm I'm curious. You know, here it seems like we learn more from you know from the negative. You know, don't do this. Be afraid of this. Uh, as opposed to from the positive, this was a marvelous thing. This, you know, th this is something we encourage you to do. I'm curious if that's, you know, prevalent in, you know, in other cultures as well, because that kind of formulates this whole good and evil thing, because it sets up more of that polarity. I know this is bad because I've been told not to do it. The opposite of that may be good then. You probably can answer your own question by looking at some of the other world's cultures, mm -hmm. and the fear aspects are usually generated. Um, through through a religious context, and we have you know we have this huge uh, thing blowing up now in the Islamic world. Um, and there's there's all kinds of fear aspects in some of the Hindu countries and in the um, the Buddhist countries that in, you know Southeast Asia. There's a lot of fear there, and a lot of it is generated from those religious belief systems. I, I wrote a song to my, for my two boys when they were probably about five or six years old. It was called Don't Do This and Don't Do That. <laughs> and it was just simply to show the silliness of, you know, can't do this, can't do that. You know. So there was all this list of things they couldn't do. And um, when I would be saying that to one of them, the other one would be behind my back. <laughs> but it, 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 it can be kind of humorous when you think about all the things we're told not to do. And when one takes an examination of what those items are, I mean, there are some that, you know, things you don't want to do. 
But there are a lot of things that are culturally oriented, biased, and generated out of social norms that really have no place in our life. They only have a place because somebody put them there. So you've got to kind of take a dustpan and brush and sweep them all up and throw those particular unneedful things out. But it's difficult because you cannot implant wisdom or even um, good counsel, if it even isn't register up the wisdom scale, to someone who either doesn't believe what you're saying or is not ready to receive what you have to say. And, you know, just think about trying to tell an adolescent about things they ought not to do because, you know, actually I did it when I was your age and it wasn't a good idea. So I'm sharing with you that experience and then they go do it and they find, oh, dad was right. <laughs> Here comes the cops bringing me home. <laughs> so th- th- there are huge cultural problems around the world and it is a fundamental problem of humanity, the concept of good and evil and, and some of the things we put in those categories. And people will believe earnestly and uh, and in the deepest aspects of their being heartfully of what you know what it is they're hanging on to and it doesn't make it correct mm-hmm. it just makes it what they believe right. you look back it's maybe it's humorous but i still have resentment about religion i mean even just on the secular side how much enculturation there is but i, st- I was raised presbyterian light so I'm not any kind well, of that answers a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> but even even with this very modern approach, I still remember vividly, maybe first and second grade, pictures depicting the Bible. There's one Jesus loves me and with lambs, and I can still see it vividly. Another one, sinners at the hands of an angry God, and it's a, pic- a spider over That's over. Calvin, yeah. It's what? Calvin. Calvin, yeah, yeah. I still remember that. I still, and and I really resent it. I mean, it's humorous, yeah, looking back 60-some years ago. But really, it really is painful in the sense of how much you are affected in, in such a deep, fundamental way. Because, geez, your parents seem to believe this stuff. And I just feel, to your point, it gets in the way of, uh, truth seeking, wisdom acquiring. Yeah. So, I'm not sure what my point is, but that's my point. <laughs> but I want to, can I follow up? Because I, this is related to my question. No, I can't. No, well, so I'm trying to paraphrase Daniel's question. And I'll say the way he said it, and then I'll say my interpretation of it. So, But you told at the beginning, you told this story of, of the sub, subconscious, I think you called them, cre- you know, that it was all subconscious creatures. Mm-hmm. And that in this, in this knowledge, then there could be consciousness. And the way he put it to me is he said, you know, in all the mythology, so much of it makes sense. And he goes, this one doesn't really make sense to me because I think what he was trying to figure out was, what was this, why did this happen? I mean, was there a purpose? What was this loving God <coughs> trying to help us do? And you know, and I remember I flippantly, I, I'm, I'm, I always try to answer him, so I'm like, hmm. I said, maybe it was like, you know, maybe it was his way of, or why, why did they get tempted? Why weren't they allowed to just live in beauty? And I said, maybe it was, maybe it was God's way of saying, whatever you do, don't think about a red fire truck, you know, because he felt like in doing that, yeah. in tempting them, that it would actually cause expansion. But that's just my, I'm just making that stuff up, you know, so... <laughs> Well, I am curious what you think about this idea of, like, why? Well, I could say, well, did you want to answer that, Michael? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, according to Jewish theology, that uh, the analysis is that they were quite young um, in, in a modern way of thinking. They were teenagers. And a, a teenage mind is still tempted, is, is still into the world, and hasn't developed enough inner strength to discern properly. And so the question arises from that, well, how come this happened when they couldn't do anything about it? Right. And the answer is that we go through a maturation process where we change significantly if we ever find that reality of 
knowing that God consciousness again. Say that last part, that, that last sentence that again. In order that what we're about is to know God. <clears throat> Not the man in the sky, but that consciousness. Mm -hmm. The consciousness of knowing. And that takes growth and maturation beyond the fall. There's, an, yeah, there's a, a Buddhist thing that kind of attaches to that idea of the maturation of consciousness. <clears throat> but we have to understand that humanity as a species has a particular um, destiny, if you will. And the very fact that it's mentioned, even if you just take it allegorically, that, that the monastic principle, man was created in the image and likeness of the Ruach Elohim, the creative powers of the life breath, um, that there's a journey that humanity is on. And so the journey moves from instinctual consciousness, and I'll, I'll use that instead of unconscious, because right. you know the animal right. kingdom operates instinctually. Right. But humanity, for the most part, operates intellectually or mentally. And, that's, and then there's this place of contact that is called uh, booty, or it might, in, in the Hebrew church, would be called bria. It's this, it's this particular level of, of awareness and consciousness. But in between instinctual and intuitional is intellectual. And it's a very, very dangerous journey. And we can see that. We can kill ourselves and blow up the planet and mm -hmm. do all kinds of horrible things. And at the same time, we can do marvelous things as well. Mm -hmm. And so we're in this monastic orb, if you will, that lies between instinct and booty. And in that journey, we're developing first uh, what is called kama manas, which is the instinctual emotional mind that's a lower aspect of the mind where we start thinking about what we should have said and we get all fired up but, but we think it through but the emotional is still tincting the, the mental aspect then there's the aspect of the mind that is facts and figures and information and, uh, and it, it kind of clouds our operation because we're trying we try to figure everything out then there's the place of a higher mind where we we, we use reason and logic until it kind of bumps up against this amniotic sac which wraps the entire mental field and it begins to perforate and this buddhic consciousness begins to precipitate into our higher mind and that begins to give us the first glimmerings of a true intuition and that is and that brings us to, to what david was talking about the, to know the uh, michael, excuse me rabbi michael sorry to bring us to the, the the consciousness and identification with this deity this beingness mm -hmm. but it's not possible in its full uh, awareness if we get stuck in the mental field but it's the field we have to traverse there's no skipping over it mm -hmm. everybody would like to say hey, it's too mental let's skip over it just go to intuition well that's the path that where humanity is on and we have to traverse that path from the lowest aspect of the mind to the highest aspect of the mind. And many scientists who've brought so many wonderful things into our world uh, were able to tap into that Buddhic stream that gave them... And all of a sudden a miracle happened. And they get this flash of awareness about something that they can bring in. I don't know if you ever saw that, um, that, uh, that the two scientists that... Have, a blackboard and he's showing all these mathematical formulas and then there's a dot 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 he says and then a miracle happened and then right. he goes on and finishes the equation. Yeah. So so those things happen and there's and, and that's sort of an occult explanation, if you will, for the process that allows for this higher intuitional aspect to precipitate into our mental field. And eventually that becomes the primary mode of operation and then reason and logic um, start to fall away. Because this um, isn't contrary to reason. As a matter of fact, you can't, not you can't reason yourself into booty, but once you've attained to some aspect of it, you can see the logic behind it by picking up the bread crumbs. And so that's, that's the journey that we're on, and we're all we're slogging that out. And we're all on some level of that development, whether it's from the karma monastic emotional mind to, to the buddhic mind, and everything that lies in between. It's a huge journey. And we have to sort it out or we'll end up, you know. And so part of that is breaking the illusions of fear of this good and bad, you know, breaking through those illusions, seeing mm -hmm. with more right view. Yeah. The, that's the yeah. yes. traversing. Uh, so and there speak. are three aspects, too. It's not just illusion. There's a thing called maya. There's a thing called glamour. And there's a thing called illusion. 
and the Maya aspect deals with things physical and our perception of it, which is less correct most of the time. The glamour is more emotional in nature, and it's how we like to present the world. And we're not talking about a magazine. We're talking about how we want to be perceived by the world that isn't really who we are. Mm -hmm. And we get mired down in the glamour aspect. And that all deals with what we would call the astral influence. But then the illusion is wrong interpretation. It's not necessarily presenting a wrong image on purpose, but in misinterpretation of information or data. And eventually, um, the illusions become clarified. So those are th three veils, if you will, that we all have to sort through. The, the, the maya of form, the glamour of the astral plane and the lower mind, and then the illusion of the middle range mind towards the higher mind, until they actually are burned away through this precipitation of uh, what we would call intuition or, or, or buddhic consciousness. Can you translate that into... Um you didn't get the <laughs> in, no into a um, uh, different nomenclature. Uh, having just read Michael's uh, dissertation, false right. self and real self. Okay, sure. Mm. We can go well. The false self and real self, and I, and I haven't read Michael's paper yet, but I'm, I'm since we've probably studied some of the same things, and he from maybe a slightly different perspective. That there is the there's the personality, which is. Let me just kind of throw this down. You don't like this. This isn't going to help you at all. At least I think you know. That everything is an expression of something else. So that there is this really high aspect of beingness that is who we are. But because it exists and it wants to function on a denser plane, it has to, it has to create a vehicle, which we might call a soul. And the soul wants to function on a denser plane and it creates a vehicle called a personality. Okay? So you got these three aspects. Are you with me? No. It's like sending. Okay, that's all right. It's like sending um, the Voyager out into space. It's a vehicle, and it gets information, or the the Beagle that landed on Mars, and so on. It collects information. It's not people. The car is not a person that you're driving, and th those spacecraft are not the persons who are wanting to collect the data. All right. So the real self is is maybe back at the mission control, getting data. The false self is the instrument that's out there trying to get information. Because I view it more in terms of ego. Mm -hmm. When you say personality, you're not talking ego now, okay. are you? Well, that, you, have, you have to be careful with the word ego, and, and probably the more popularized version of the word ego is accepted as the me, 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 I, I, I ego, where in, in, the, in some of the Kabbalistic trainings and theosophical teachings, the ego, there's a divine ego, okay? Mm. And, that, and that is in the divine ego that is centered in the heart of humanity, as opposed to the personality ego. And when we think of the word ego, we're really talking about a centrally uh, or a, a logoic center. Like the sun is the center of the solar system, the ego is the center of the personality, but there's also a divine ego that's the center of, of the soul aspect. And then there's a central self that is the center of um, Yahida would be the, 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 the central self, the higher aspect that is the causal factor of the existence of the soul. So, I don't know if it helps you or not, but, but basically we're dealing with vehicles of expression. So what I'm hearing is the ego actually encompasses different pieces, not just the personality, right? It's a different ego. Different ego. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a different center of orientation. Like our planet is centered right now and is oriented towards Polaris, but in a few thousand years, I believe it's Aldorim, and when, when the... Earth will slide over this way, it'll have a different pole star, a different orientation. And so when we're oriented towards the personal ego, the, the, the personality, it's the I, me focus. Which is not saying the same as a false self. No, you're that saying, is the false that self. Is that is a false that self. False. Okay, that helps me out. Okay. That's one and the same. All right. yeah. A truer self would be the aspect of the ego related to the soul, and the truer, still more truer self beyond that is that is what we would call the central self, <clears throat> and, and, and which is was as transcendent to even the Buddhic consciousness that we talk about. Dave, Freud Michael. defined the ego as the executive function that knows right from wrong, uh, that can do the right thing in the moment. Yeah. So for optimal functioning. And it's not that the ego is bad. If, if we look at it from the personality, it's a vehicle of expression. And so it's our task to attune that vehicle to 
the other, like a plumb line, you know. Any plumb line held suspended from the fingers will point to the center of the earth. And so we want to be on the plumb, if you will, with this higher aspect, so that the lower aspect and the higher aspect are in alignment and eventually fuse as one existent. See, I take all those words you just said, and I said, it's, it's the false self uh, approaching the real self, or the real self approaching the false. I mean, that's that my simplistic way of no, interpreting what you said. And I'm not saying that I say it the best way, but um, it is, you, you nailed it on the head, I say right there. But it seems as though our culture today has evolved into this place where everything's oriented towards uh, having this false self, this mm -hmm. standard ego. That's where the focus there. is. Mm -hmm. And it's all rewarding, and, mm -hmm. and it's what creates all the separateness and the competition sure. and self-promotion and pushing others down. And so, I mean, I hope, my view is this is an evolutionary stage we're trying to yeah. get out of. Sure. And, and, and attendant to that, how many times has anyone applied for a job and it says, <laughs> How aligned are you with this, with your true self? <laughs> <laughs> they want to know where you went to school, what your job was, how successful you were, and what you did. They want your resume. Uh, they don't want to know how aligned you are with your central self. You know, which is just, yeah. So, and, and you're right because the major capacity of perception, <coughs> excuse me, for the human race, is the physical plane. No, we don't think in terms of that there's an astral plane, and that there's a vital body that exists. And the reason why the physical plane exists is because it's a precipitation from something else. Sorry, Steve. You know, I say <laughs> that alignment, going back to Wendy's point, is, is getting on the fear aspect of it. Because a lot of the false self, as I perceive things, is out of fear, right? Mm -hmm. Can I say it right? Yeah. yeah. So good and evil is strictly a phenomenon in the physical world. Um, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily true. Um, I, I try to define evil and good in, in this particular way. And that has to do with purpose and intention. What is it that you're wanting to accomplish? And I'll, I just use this as an example. Let's say Steve is getting on the train and he's going to San Francisco, or, some, or parts west anyway, right? But actually he ends up going east. It's out of purpose, it's out of intention. That would be defined as evil relative to what it is you're trying to accomplish. You define that as evil. Well, I'm trying to use this as an, ana an analogy. Don't take it literally, okay? But in other words, anything that is moving away Out from alignment, from alignment, away from good. Yeah, good. alignment for what you're trying to accomplish is. Um, to me, that just is a mistake. Okay. I mean, I yeah, well, okay, fair enough. But but th let's let's, let's take it this way. Okay, let let's take it a different way. Right. Let's say that um, somebody paid you to go to San Francisco, but you put the money in your pocket and you decided to go to New York, okay? You're going in a different direction than, than your purpose and requirement is. So there is this idea of, of operating against purpose and intention. That's evil, operating mm -hmm. against... Purpose and intention. Purpose and intention? Yeah, but, it's, but it operates at a much higher turn of the spiral. I'm just trying to use that as an analogy. And maybe that's not working, Wendy. So does that translate to what's going on in the world today, to like what's happening with ISIS, right? Because I would say, in that definition, those individuals fully believe that they are operating in their purpose, right? Yeah. Well, mm. the rest of the world is saying, yeah. absolutely not. Sure, and so the big question is, it's not the purpose necessarily of the individual or the group, but the purpose of the human race and the direction in which it is headed. So there's a larger context now mm -hmm. that humanity is moving towards this, this whole uh, level of awareness where we're becoming world citizens, not uh, citizens of an enclave, that we only do things that are good for this group. We take into account parts and wholes, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and therefore the parts have to align to the purpose of the whole. <clears throat> and so ISIS is not working on behalf of the whole or of, of the evolution of humanity, it's holding on to an ancient idea whose, whose ideas are outworn. Those, those, Sharia law had a purpose at the time it was established. It doesn't have a place in, in the society. And many of the religions that go back thousands of years, they either have to begin to orient themselves towards the evolution of humanity and what the next step is, 
or they will eventually disappear. I mean, you don't see too many Zarathustrans rolling around or people uh, worshiping the Sumerian gods I mean, because at a time they were appropriate. And now it's, it's different. So, but I was watching an interview recently on the BBC of a gentleman who was in London who was actually, you know, they're pointing to him as being very instrumental in recruiting. And I think the thing that always strikes me is how very much they absolutely believe yeah. that they are. They, mm -hmm. There isn't any inclination to them that they're doing something outside of what the, is the benefit for the whole. They really believe that they're fighting for the benefit of the whole. They do believe it. And that's that comes back to uh, what Michael was saying about the maturation of consciousness. That co one has to do with enculturation, whether it's a recent enculturation, which they call brainwashing, um, or an enculturation from the area in which you grow up. You have to you have to begin to look at the destiny of humanity, and where is it where is it going, and what are the things necessary in order for it to reach that purpose. Now we could take the same problem that we see with ISIS, and it is uh, uh, it is counter to the evolution of humanity and where it's going. And we can also look at um, healthcare and the fact that it's run by a profit motive. Mm -hmm. You know that's not moving in the in the, in the interest of humanity, becoming a more sympathize, synthesized um, unit of, of a life, of the entire humanity, um, and trying to uh, bring everyone along. So, and you can take almost any area, there, there are those institutions that don't care about the life of the whole. They care about the life of the unit. And well, I certainly 100% agree with the ISIS, but not so sure about the health care. Okay, sure. not, I'm, not, I'm not taking a position. My question is, who's to say? Who's to judge the right way, the right purpose? Sure. And, and the only way and, and we can do this, as far as I know, and, I, and when I preempt that with the only way, it was already suspect, right? But um, we have to look at where humanity is going as a whole. Can, can we at least hold a vision for that? And if if we are a family, a global family, if we are to support each other and to help see that every human being has an opportunity to be educated, to be fed, to be housed, are we in agreement with those things? I'm just... I am. Yeah, I am okay. But I'm not God Almighty. No, no, you're not God Almighty. We've no, no. we got to do the best we can with what we got. So so, so we, that's why we have sound boards and people that we talk to and so you're not drinking your own Kool-Aid too long and start running off doing things. But if we if we look at the, 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 the trajectory of the human family, where it's going and what it is we think we need to do in order to help create that, there are certain requirements. And, and you know, it, and you can call it a judgment and, and sometimes judgment is absolutely necessary. And one can make a mistake in judgment, but that's why we have governmental institutions, even though they may run amok here and there. We yeah, have, uh, yeah, we do have to watch it. This country was founded on some great principles, and we've kind of drifted from that. But life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is a wonderful thing. But that's not what's happening here. Okay, so to try to answer your question as best I can is to look at the whole, to see where it's headed, and to find out what steps are necessary in order to see that unfold. And anything that, that gets in the way of that, we could either say is an obscuration, an obstacle, evil may be a strong term, but if we're going to eventually make that mark and make that grade, there are things that have to be changed. And most people won't do it because they don't want to be the first one. I'm not going to be the first one to lay down my gun. No way. Well, also you know? by convenience. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what comes to my mind is we all know that... Uh, <clears throat> driving our cars and flying our airplanes and yeah. we all know <clears throat> that is detrimental to the well-being of the planet right. that is detrimental to um, <clears throat> people living by the ocean mm -hmm. uh, Bangladesh and so on but we still do it yes that is correct now would you say that's right. evil would you say that's evil that well, act of living by and wanting yeah. Instead of calling things good and evil, right. let's look at two poles of good and evil. And then there is this sort of center, center point, the Madhumika, the noble middle path. And then there is this, this, this balance that goes on. If you're on this side of the balance towards the evil point, it's less than correct. If you're on this side, 
um, it's heading towards correctness, but it hasn't necessarily hit the mark yet. So you have uh, less than correct heading towards <clears throat> wrong view, and you have less than correct heading towards right view. Mm -hmm. So there's a spectrum. Instead of just making it good and evil, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring a subject up, is that we tend to make them polarized when, in fact, most of the things are here in, in the middle ground. I much prefer when you did, I'll shut up now, but I much no. prefer when you mm -hmm. say right view, wrong view, yeah. as opposed to good and evil. Yeah. I mean, it's such sure. a, well, it's, it's, it's touching the absolutes, right? You're that's absolutely right. And it wasn't my intention to create the absolutes. I brought that subject title up because that's how people see things generally, it's good or it's evil, instead of seeing it as this, as this movement and maturation of consciousness. Right, you know, yeah. It's a, it's a um, constant dilemma. Well, it is a constant dilemma. Well, it's constant until it's not constant anymore, and that is that in, until an individual has reached the point where they have made that grade. But it happens one at a time. Mm -hmm. And we may have a major, uh, as Roger's kind of trying to point out, there's a, a shift about to happen in the human race. So it's either going to be mass extinction or we're going to make the grade. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put words in your mouth about that. But I think, I agree. okay. So there is, there is a, a, a watermark that we can now attain, but that's going to require, and, and some of the things that Dominique talked about, is, is saying, okay, driving, flying our planes out of convenience, driving our cars out of convenience, are not helping the situation. What can we do to change that? Well, there are technologies that might be able to help that, but until then, we're still driving around in our cars and warming them up for 20 minutes, you know, so it's warm and toasty when we get in the car. Yes? So, I'd like to just bring up another aspect of it, and that is, you know, all of this, what we're doing here on the Earth is an expression of the consciousness. Um, my aunt said to me one time, Hitler was only expressing the consciousness of the people at the time. And so I think it's, you know, something to think about for, if you want to bring it back down to each person and what can we do. Um, it travels, it's vibratory, it's, it's, we're, you know, energetic beings. And so to tap into that power that I like, I like to think of it as power, you know, that's, that's a place where I think change can happen. You know, what you just said is really important, and there's another thing to consider in that. And that is that, you know, back in the time of Tesla, when he did the, if you're all familiar with at least the name anyway, there's a really nice car driving around these days called the Tesla. Um, he performed an experiment, it's called the Colorado, Colorado Springs experiment, but it really happened in Manitou Springs, it didn't happen in Colorado Springs. But he was able to illuminate uh, a series of lights, that, actually the town of Manitou Springs, <coughs> using what is called scalar wave technology and not using generators and dynamos uh, that run through copper wires. And after he demonstrated that, J.P. Morgan, who owned the copper mines, pulled his funding from Tesla because, after all, it was going to mess with his sale of copper wires. They're going to be strong all over the country. That was a turning point in, in when we had an opportunity to evolve, and it didn't happen for uh, monetary reasons. And so we're back at that place again where we can begin to look at those possibilities. That technology was already proven, uh, you know, proof of principle. And, and there were certain economic powers that kept that from happening. And that's, and that's not, you know, who stole the electric car, or who stopped this thing or that thing. I mean, this was a, a scientific experiment that was, was successful. You know, there's another further piece to that story about Tesla, which is that uh, he had also... Um, discovered ways to extract energy from the atmosphere and so there would be no need for the utility company exactly. and jp morgan same sure. guy yeah. also was the founder of the utility companies and knew that if things went this way that there wouldn't be a market there same as the copper wires so the story is that jp morgan destroyed tesla's work yeah there was a fire it was yeah. wiped out and so much of what he did was just sort of intuitive and he didn't have, he wasn't in a university and teaching and writing, yeah. he just had these intuitive flashes and so a huge amount was lost in 1915 or whatever this yeah. was. So I would, I would call that more towards the evil side of things. I'm you know? <laughs> not going to stipulate that yeah. J.P. Morgan was evil. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. No. no, I'm just saying that, that, would, that would, would be in, in there. It was, may not be the ringing the bell, you know, when you hit the ball and the thing goes up and hits the... T it may not be that, but it was definitely took us back and, and created delay. And so we're faced with that same situation now. And, and what are the forces that are keeping that from unfolding? I think what's interesting is that when you say right view, wrong view, versus good and evil, 
it automatically allows a certain amount of acceptance and compassion that allows you to think that there's an opportunity to influence. Whereas when I automatically label evil, and going back to the ISIS example, mm -hmm. when I think of that's pure evil, for me personally, it cuts it off in my mind. I'm like, sure. you're yeah. worthless. Mm -hmm. When I say it's a wrong view, then it opens up this possibility of perhaps there's an opportunity to influence, perhaps there's an opportunity to change. So it isn't quite as dramatic. Mm -hmm. I, I think just in that definition alone, it allows a lot more room for potential change. If you look at the causal factors for, say for example, the existence of many of the problems that exist in the Middle East, they didn't germinate in the Middle East, they, or at least the seed wasn't planted. There was planted by Western concerns. Um, so if we, if we look at the, the, the karmic aspects, the law of cause and effect, you know that this thing is, has, has arisen out of some really very bad um, or decisions made from wrong view. Mm -hmm. um, there was something else that was I'm trying to grab that was floating around in my head, and I just um, I just lost it. Oh, so getting back to this idea, where is humanity going, and what is necessary to help bring things around? If we look at the amount of money we have spent on on trying to control things in the Middle East or in fighting wars that should have never been fought, and we spent that money on making sure that on infrastructure, on education, and on feeding and housing people. Sure, it may look like everybody's on the dole at first, but what happens when that little kid that, that grows up in a disenfranchised culture becomes educated and becomes a, a contributor to society and maybe invents something that saves all our butts? I mean, that's the kind of uh, work that needs to be taken care of. Even as far back as the Buddha, when he talked about that ignorance is the is the uh, you know the, the the remedy to ignorance is wisdom, but wisdom is a is a graded stage to attain. So one has to use the raw materials to attain wisdom, and that's knowledge, and knowledge is achieved through education, and yet we've been told that thousands of years ago, and we still are chipping away at our educational system, even in our own country, let alone not allowing it in in other in other countries. Those are, those are the requirements, food, shelter, education. If, they, if we can see that that happens around the world, we can change the course of events. If we don't, um, then we may be able to make some modifications, but the prognosis is really terrible. It goes back to fear again. Fear that others are going to be knowledgeable and take control. I mean, that insidious mindset of uh, needing to, well, greed... Greed and sure. our, control. Our, our, but fear is the, is a good word. It's like, for example, I just listened to National Public Radio this morning that, you know, 68% uh, of the population of Ferguson County are black or minorities, and yet 100% or close to it, 95% of the police force are white. I mean, that sounds like apartheid to me. <laughs> but the thing is that it's, there's, it's fear on both sides. The, the police are afraid they're going to get shot on the street, and the, and the people in Ferguson don't trust the police because they act uncharitable towards them. So there's a huge problem. But education and sharing and uh, the other thing they said that in was it 2045 there will be no majority or minority race in this country. That it'll be such a melting pot that the Asians and the Hispanics and the blacks and the whites will will sort of level the playing field in terms of numbers. And what, what an interesting idea that um, we no longer have to be concerned about um, losing our authority to the newcomers. <laughs> well, Kevin, I wonder what the identities would be like that day when it's all blended yeah. sort of genetically, but are, do we still have cultural enclaves as now? You know, they tried to force with busing, they tried to force integration of the schools in the 60s and 70s yeah. and, and force people into integrated neighborhoods, but they found out that people tended to just still want to live in black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods. Sure. And, well, they talk so about some of actually assimilate. Kind you of have Somalis, you have Arabs, you have Jews, you have white people, you know, wasps, if I can use that term. And they all go to the same school and they all sit at their separate tables when they eat lunch, you know. <laughs> you know, we experienced that with Sam Max to, uh, to a bilingual school, University Hill, when he was young. He was very excited about the idea. He was a big soccer fan. He was excited about the idea of playing with the Latino kids during recess. And you know, spoke the language because it was bilingual and absolutely could not break through the mm -hmm. barrier. You know, it, it shocked mm -hmm. us. And there was, you know, and there was no prejudice that we could say. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, you know, stay away from this gringo. It was, you know, they really... Together. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Governor Lamb, 30 years ago, Governor Whitey. <laughs> gave a uh, incredible speech. It was called, How I Would Destroy America. On that very point, forget it if you think is natural assimilation. I have had his, and he gave the whole list exactly what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Just responding kind of to your point there. Yeah. I'll, I'll email it to anybody who wants to read it. It's just it's fabulous. Mm. How to destroy America. <clears throat> but we have these identities. We seem to want to get into groups, the us, you know, and isn't that still that conventional ego kind of? It, it is. And the, and the fear that comes out of that. And, so here, here, here's what we've observed, you know, in, in the history of humanity. I mean, you want to add this to your tool chest. But humanity has gone through a period of, and, and a series of decentralizations. And so if we look at our old ideas around, at least in Europe, you know, around the, the 1300s, 1400s, you know, they looked at the Earth as the center of the solar, of the universe, not the solar the center of the universe. And they developed a really wacky sense of astronomy to to demonstrate that this is true but it just got so difficult because they were creating all of these stories and elliptical orbits and things that you know they just kind of fell under its own weight until of course galileo said wait a second the sun's the center so then they thought for a long time the sun was the center of the universe until we were able to look at um you know a pole star that you know stars revolved around or that we had a galaxy that had a center and you are here you ever see that t-shirt the big galaxy and then we find out that our galaxy is just one of six in the Virgo cluster, and then there's and then there's that cluster that revolves around another center, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this whole process of decentralization. Now that's our cosmic awareness, if you will, around the, the larger picture of our universe. But there's also the decentralization of oneself. You know, you're not the center of the universe. You don't get to have four biscuits when three people are sitting at the table. You know, and I've seen that happen with adolescents. You know, they want. Well, they don't think about other people, so, or some people don't think about other people. So then you start thinking about the context of the family and making sure everybody gets a share. And then the family thinks in context of the community, etc. I don't have to beat it to death, but it, this decentralization continues. We're at a place now where we're really beginning to look at a, a global centralization. And we, that means we have to decentralize ourselves past what is in our national interest. You'll hear that all the time on Capitol Hill. Well, it's not really in our national interest to save the thousands of lives in this country who are being murdered. Well, why it's, it's in our interest, period, as global citizens. And, and that's the decentralization piece that's breaking down. And you see nationalism rearing its head all over the place. It's happening in, in Russia and Ukraine, and it's happening in various other countries. And it certainly is never, the flag waving has never died down in this country. You know, and I mean, I mean, I love this country, and I love the symbol of what the flag is supposed to represent. But I'm, I'm not necessarily needing to keep it the center of the cosmos. And that's the decentralization process that continues. And that's one of the big steps globally. And in the meantime, we have to think about parts and holes and how we do things on behalf of a larger group and not just for myself or for my family or my religion or my country. It's the concept of American exceptionalism, which you see uh -huh. as the issue. That yeah, but it's not all that exceptional in some ways either. <laughs> I mean, there are some exceptional things, but there are more... Indian, and I, I'm talking about Hindus or uh, the Indian government, there are more geniuses in India than there are children in the United States. <laughs> so uh, we think about more genius children than there are children in the United States because they, they, they really inculcate that kind of a thing here. You know, Kevin, you talked about this progression with the the Copernican Revolution or whatever, where the universe got bigger and bigger and we got smaller and smaller, and yeah. then the existentialists say it's all meaningless. And, yeah. and But there's this new emerging worldview, which is being called the evolutionary worldview, which right. is what we talk about, beginning with the Big Bang. And it begins to look more and more like, rather than us being completely insignificant and minuscule, almost to the other extreme, that we're at the leading edge of this incredible unfolding. This is it. This is the moment. We are the Big Bang, you know. Like, on, we are the center, after, you know. And it's, the truth. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to shake out, but uh, that is that larger picture which defines what is good when you look at that overall step back and look at the evolving universe and evolving humanity. It's, 
with the uh, <clears throat> information highway knowledge, decentralization of knowledge mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. um, that is floating around and <clears throat> that we're becoming more knowledgeable in the way that we bear more responsibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> what is the impact of what we do and what we decide when we move on things? that we have more impact now than ever before in the sense of responsibility <coughs> comes from that knowledge when we think that what we do is okay but we know it's not but it's our responsibility to act on it individually I don't see that we're not doing anything wrong, but just like you were talking about the Nazi regime, the, the conductor or the, the engineer of the locomotive on the train was just driving a train, deporting people from one place to another to bring them to extermination camps. All he was doing was driving a train. Right. Mm. But if he knows mm. Mm. what's happening at one end, what's happening at the other end, it's still only driving a train. Yeah. Nothing wrong about that, nothing evil about it. I'm just driving a train. Like we are doing a lot of things that we, we buy certain type of food that come from certain places that are produced a certain way. We have we have access to that knowledge. Mm -hmm. We have wrapping that we trash, and we know what happens there. We can know what happens. It's all available. Global warming, weather um, <clears throat> turmoil, and political. When we when we buy, when you consume, we vote every time we vote, and we have that knowledge. With that comes an increased sense of responsibility and we're more we have more power and more openings into saying yeah, I'm doing this and I'm conscious of that choice based on all the knowledge that I can that I have access to than ever before mm -hmm. before being raised Catholic it was wrong to eat meat on Friday mm -hmm. You can go to communion if you had, that was right and wrong. It was not based on information. It was like pushed on you and it was enculturation and it was religion. And it was just, it was simple. It's a simple world. But now, with that circulation of knowledge, it's where there's enhanced responsibility, in a way enhanced burden, but also tremendous potential for getting to a higher level of consciousness. I think it's, it's about creating a greater level of relevancy, though, in our media environment, right? Because I think you can have a knowledge, but if it doesn't impact you in your immediate situation, you're less likely to change your behavior mm -hmm. because it doesn't impact you at a level of relevance that, that you can connect to. But mm -hmm. ideally, as we continue to gain more knowledge, and yes, the more responsibility and the burden, it's also becoming more relevant to our day-to-day -day operations, such that it, you know, that we then are motivated to make that change. Because it's really easy to be like, well, you know, I have clean water and I'm drinking water, and I know water is an issue, but does that motivate me to turn my tap off when I'm brushing my teeth? You know, it's those type mm -hmm. of decisions day to day. For me, it does now because. You know, there's a relevance in certain experiences that I've had that influences that. But I think until we, we have that direct influence, it's harder to make that immediate behavioral change mm -hmm. with that knowledge, with the knowledge. But the knowledge allows you to be real-time connected to yes. all kind of events yes. around the world yes. that are triggered by all kind of actions that are 
taking place. Yes. Just filling your car with gas. Those, those are really important points. And what the consequence of those things, when you take those and, and take action on them, is that it does begin to synthesize the human family when we all kind of still do it. Mm -hmm. Because the next step, and Roger asked the question, and, and I'm going to throw it out there, is to become a, a part of a solar systemic community. I mean, it's we're not the only act in town. We can talk about that stuff later. But when we show and demonstrate our ability to be with one another, and be custodians of our Earth's sphere, then we can be trusted to participate in a larger picture. That, and mm -hmm. there's, you know, we can we can let that go for now because there's no, at least blatant proof to the masses of humanity. Even though there's a lot of proof out there for those who are willing to look. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the next step: is to be part of this community. Mm -hmm. But we have to prove that we can be part of this community on Earth, and that hasn't happened yet. Mm 